Well, aloha and good morning. Thank you so much for joining Ryan and I this morning here on Spotlight Hawaii. For those of you who have been watching us for some time now, you know that we've been live streaming uh, in partnership with the paper and some other entities, but now we have shifted our focus and shifted gears. Everything, of course, Ryan does relate to the coronavirus, but today uh, and for the rest of this month, we are really honing in on local politics. That's right. The show is really meant to shed a spotlight on some of the things that are happening in our community. So as Yanji and I have been broadcasting for the past three months on COVID, the spotlight has certainly been on that. Uh, but we're shifting the spotlight to another important thing that's happening in our community. That, that of course, is the race for Honolulu Mayor. So for the next few weeks, we will be here every Monday and Wednesdays, beginning at 1030 to spotlight some of the candidates that are running and vying to become the next mayor of Honolulu. And joining us today is a special guest. That's right. She is a lawyer, a former congresswoman. We are going to be welcoming a uh, congresswoman, former congresswoman Colleen Hanabusa. We also want to let you know uh, that this is brought to you by the Office of Elections, and we're going to have some important election information for you at the end of the broadcast. So mahalo to our sponsor, the Office of Elections. Uh, of course, we, as we mentioned, Colleen Hanabusa is a lawyer, a former congresswoman, a longtime Hawaii lawmaker, first woman president of the Hawaii State Senate, and first woman to lead either chamber of the Hawaii State Legislature. And so we welcome Colleen Hanabusa. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're so happy to be with you. Um, let's dive right in. And we want to okay. tell the audience, put the questions in the comments. We want to get to as many of them as possible. Because campaigning is so different these days, you don't get to have as much one-on-one -on -one contact. That's why we're doing this. So let's start out with the basics. Why are you running? Hi, Yunji. <laughs> Good to see you after PBS. <laughs> and hi, Ryan. No, thank you very much for doing this because believe it or not, I think this is becoming the new norm for campaigning. I, I don't think a week goes by when we haven't done a Zoom and this is called uh, Stream Yard and I did one called Blue Jeans and it's, it, it's just fascinating. But the reason why I'm running is because of the fact that, you know, when I returned from Congress, I I couldn't believe the level of really the sense of public confidence and public confidence in government. And it had reached, in my opinion, an all time low, especially when it comes to sitting county on Honolulu. And that's because we had public corruption at the highest levels. And when you have it in law enforcement, it just augments it even more. And of course, people were losing confidence, of course, in none other than Hart, the rail project. But that was all pre COVID when I made the initial decision. Post COVID, I decided that the decision to run is was the correct one. And the reason why is because, you know, it is during this time that you need someone with experience, someone who understands all levels of government and has relationships, because that's what it always comes down to, is what kind of relationships that we do have and whether we've guarded respect, and it's important. You can't just have experience with no respect. If people don't respect you, you're not going to be able to do things for the, the people of the sitting county of Honolulu. And I also decided that this is not a time where you can afford to just not understand what government is. And government is not business. It's a very different, it has a different purpose. Government is to help people who can't help themselves. It's not a bottom line motivated and to run government like a business in this time would have been an absolute disaster. What business can go into the kind of deficit that government has to in order to make things really work for everyone else? Because this is the time that we look to government to make it work. So when you think about all of these different things and the time of COVID and what it means, I've decided that this is the right time to run and I'm the right person to be the mayor because I have all these qualifications and I can hit the ground running. And that is critical to be able to hit the ground running, understand the federal legislation, because it's only the federal government who can really help us in this time that we have to look to. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. <clears throat> you know, we have obviously a lot of things that we want to cover. Uh, so we're going to ask that uh, you try to keep your answers as concise as possible, because sure. trust me, there's a lot of topics and we only have half an hour. But of course, we touched on COVID. And so we want to just start there. Uh, you know, there is some hesitation about opening the state back up. We know the plans that are underway on August 1st. Uh, what are your thoughts about opening up the city and county of Honolulu safely? Do you feel that the right steps are being taken? And if you were in the position right now as mayor, 
how would you do things differently with reopening the uh, the economy, uh, especially the tourism sector here in uh, on the island of Oahu? You know, until until we have a vaccine, we will always be weighing the public's health, our public's health and safety with that of the economic tugs of opening up. I think that we've gotten to a point where the, the governor and the, and the governor has made very clear that he's the one who makes the decisions, uh, that, that they're kind of saying, okay, we'll do the 72 hour test, which of course is the Alaska model. However, what I would have done different is I believe that the Alaska model also has a subsequent test. And that's to ensure that if the COVID was somehow contracted between the, the 72 hours before and sometime when you come to Hawaii, that, that we can then be able to trace and we can also ensure that the testing continues. So I think that it's, it's, it's falling short of what we really need to give people the sense of a security because, you know, it's not going to work unless people feel as secure as they can, given the state of the science and the science is, is very critical. Do you support this idea of opening on August 1st? Do you think that there should be more delays to, you know, make sure that we have the kind of system that you're talking about? I mean, I think a lot of the problem, as I understand, is that um, there's just a limited capacity for tests. I believe we have the capacity mm -hmm. to test about 5,000 people per day, uh, which obviously we can't do with, I, I mean, pre-level arrivals, we're not gonna get to 30,000 a day, but um, you know, the hope is that we get to half of that. So we wouldn't be able to do that kind of secondary testing. So given that those are the limitations, do you think that we should open up on the first? You know, I, I think that we have to do something. And I think that, that as we get closer to the opening, we'll get a better sense because I'm sure you're all watching the figures as as mm -hmm. everyone else is. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, we haven't quite opened yet, but how come we're consistently in the 20s and, you know, the very high numbers already? And it, I think it's because the public feels like somehow things are, are OK because government is saying we're going to let visitors in. I don't believe necessarily that we should stop it, but I would like to ask that the governor really consider whether there's a secondary part of it. And I think it's also going to be self-selecting. Um, I, I read um, a piece in the paper, I think, where someone said they were going to come, but they decided not to because they can't even get the instructions on the 72 hours. So it's, it's going to be how prepared we are. And I think the closer we get to it, I'm hoping that... Um, the state and the counties will work together on determining how it is that we do open up. But right now, I think we we have got to uh, at least address it and give it a give it a shot, so to speak. But if we cannot address the fundamental issues, is is it really truly safe? Is 72 hours sufficient? Do we need more? And I think a lot of that's going to begin to play in as we move closer and closer. You know. We just got over 4th of July. We have quite a bit of days yet to get to the, the first. And as you know, the governor could shut it down at any time. So uh, let's let's do it. But I, I think the problem is the, the fact that the governor has announced it and the, the counties are going along with it. We have to also consider what the hotel industry is doing. It takes them about, they're saying about 30 days to prepare to open up. If that's the case, then, you know, we have to see where they are. And I'm sure all the respective hotel workers unions are already in this discussion to see what is being done, because the most important thing is the safety consideration for our people. You know, one of the questions, of course, is uh, about diversifying the economy that has certainly been brought up due to COVID-19. One of the questions from Paul, our viewers, is what is your plan to reduce the overwhelming number of tourists that normally come to Hawaii? And, and what are plans maybe to diversify uh, the economy overall. What are your thoughts on sort of diversifying the economy here in the city and county of Honolulu so it's not maybe as reliant on tourism? You know, I don't think that we'll ever get completely uh, away from tourism. Tourism is what the state is accustomed to. I think it's going to become a question of what kind of tourism we're going to have. And I think we need to, we need to begin to explore that. But in, in addition to that, I've always been an advocate of the fact that the next generation is really into technology. STEM is a very important type of industry that we're gonna have, but those industries are gonna take a while for it to 
replace something like tourism. When you're talking about tourism, you're talking about a huge number of people who are employed. So the only way you're going to be able to delay that so you can begin to define tourism or a new industry is if you have federal subsidies so that these people have a way to survive during the period of time. The reality of the situation is people want to have security for their families. And, you know, one of the issues that even if you talk about COVID that you have not uh, delved into is when all of these health funds begin to expire and how do we then take care of that? And I was in office during 9-11. Um, I was just elected in 9-11 and then, and then also in the Great Recession of 2008-2009. In those periods of time, one of the most important issues that the hotel workers, for example, raised was how to get their people covered with health insurance because the, the, the trust funds run out after a while. And, that's, and we're getting to that point. It's going to be August or September, depending on how their respective trust funds work. Now, you add that to whether or not they're working, that's a major hit all the way around. Yeah. Um, let's switch to rail. I know that uh, Armando has a question and I'm sure it's shared by many people. What's your position on rail? How can you control, how can we control the rising costs? Do you agree that she put completed all the way to Alamana stopping maybe downtown Honolulu? So this is the middle street versus Alamana versus UH. Um, you have obviously uh, a lot of experience on this particular topic because you did serve on the heart board for 15 months, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. So tell us what, where do you stand on rail and uh, where should the project end? You know, this exact question is actually something that we had studied and presented to the public. And that was because when, right when I became the chair is when they, they had the uh, authorization for the $6.8 billion, which then at that point I felt was, inadequate. And then our staff came in like within seven days and says, that's not enough money. So he said, okay, where can it end? And then that time we explored Middle Street. And for 6.8, they said we can stop at Middle Street and we'd have about $700 million in excess. So we looked at all of it. The fundamental question that the, the people have got to, to realize is that one, I don't believe that we don't have enough money at this point in time. And the reason why is I ask people to look at one thing. Did the city or heart have to float any bonds in this interim period? And in other words, did they have to borrow money? And the answer is no, they haven't. They've done what is called commercial paper, which is like short-term loans until the amount of money comes in to pay it off. But in essence, the rail funding source is there. So in addition to that, the cost of rail is like 8.3 billion for construction. The nine point something figure that everyone hears is really $1 billion worth of financing. So if the funding is as expected, which it is going to be affected by this COVID, by the way, is then what you don't have to, you, you know, that you have a cushion of $1 billion. So I think they're sufficient to get to Ala Moana. The uh, minimum operable segment, which we agreed to with the federal government to get their money, takes us to Alamona. Anything short of that, we're going to be in litigation, which, of course, I'm not adverse to. But having said that, having when we start to look at where, where we're going to be and how we're going to pay, you know, the federal government still owes us about $750 million. They stopped paying in about 2014, and they don't like the way Hart was operating then. And that's why even till today, they don't have any of the money available. So there's money that's still there that's supposed to be part of this pot. So I think that it should be sufficient. And this PPP, which they're looking at, the P3 project, is going to be one that's supposed to be running with on itself. And remember, the contracts that were issued, in my opinion, prematurely to Ansaldo, also has in it the operational costs. So some of these operational costs that we're looking at will be covered in that contract. So would you essentially, you're supporting the project going all the way to Ala Moana. Uh, what are your thoughts on those who suggest that it should continue on to the University of Hawaii and beyond? Uh, what would your plan sort of be to outline uh, further development or expansion of the project once it gets to that point? You know, when rail was first conceived by this, this, the city, 
uh, it was supposed to go to UH Manoa. It was actually going to go from Kapolei to Manoa. And what happened is that there was insufficient financing. So when they signed what is called the full funding grant agreement in December of 2012, and I was in Congress and we did a ceremonial signing, it was ending in Ala Moana. So there's sort of an inherent promise that it was going to UH Manoa. Having said that, however, there isn't enough money, of course, to do that. And it would take a whole new um, negotiations, probably with the city, I mean, with the state, because the city that I don't believe has that kind of funds, cities has to worry about the operational costs and the maintenance costs. So I, I think that it's going to be a matter of negotiating with the state and whether or not you can call the segment from Ala Moana to UH Manoa as a fresh start again and ask the feds for a contribution. Remember when this project started, the feds were supposed to contribute 30%. And now, you know, at the rate we're going, we'll be lucky if uh, they contribute 15%. And right now, we, if, it, if it's a estimated almost 10 billion, they're only contributing 7.5%. So, you know, it's, when you look at it that way, it tells you how important and how critical management and understanding the financing on this project is. I don't think people are, are going to agree to fund rail. Uh, at the most, we can expect it to go to where it's destined to go, so we don't have to deal with the federal government, and that's to Ala Moana. But anything more than that, I think we have to really hit the pause button until we can get some agreement with the state. They're, they're the only ones who could help. And at, right now, I would tell you, uh, my friends in the state are not willing to talk about rail. <laughs> they, they're not. <laughs> they've told me very clearly, don't come back. So mm -hmm. let's move on to another big issue for our community, and that is the issue of homelessness. Uh, Cheryl Sitsumi says, what's your stance on homelessness with so many people suffering economically now because of the pandemic that will likely become an even bigger problem? Um, you know, do you agree with Mayor Caldwell's, uh, I think they call it compassionate disruption, which is basically the sit live bans uh, in various communities? Do you think that that's effective? And uh, what would you do differently on this one? You know, I I read the uh, Ninth Circuit decision on the sit line ban that, that happened in Idaho, which is very similar. And also the fact that the Supreme Court uh, denied certiorari on it, which basically the law of the land right now is that sit line bans are, quote, unconstitutional unless you have sufficient shelter space. So unless you have the sufficient shelter space to move them into it's deemed to be cruel and unusual punishment that was the wording that the uh, appellate court used in the idaho case so I, I think one of the main problem we have is that we tend to broad brush homelessness we tend to think everyone is the same and that's that's far from the truth we have those who need uh basically uh, mental health services and we do know that a law was passed in 2018 i think in the state that allows for um I think they call it ACT, which is, you know, being able to give them meds. But even that requires a due process so that what the city did was, and this may be the compassionate component of it, what the city did was they gave $500,000 to the entity to, to basically take them to family court and to defend them so that we can have a situation where they've had their due process and they're not forced to take you know, without for, and then they get to take their meds. So we have that segment. The one thing that I think that COVID has done, and it's a Kehi Lagoon where you have little pup tents, people are seeking shelter because something I think that's, that's outweighing everything else is your health. So people want to be protected. So I think when you have a situation like that, this is an opportunity to go in and to give them services and get them accustomed to having the services and then moving them on. A lot of it is because we have people who are traditionally houseless because they just don't have enough money to spend on rent and so forth. And those people are more likely to go into shelter. So I think it comes down to how to shelter. But those who we would consider chronically or mentally ill or have alcohol problems, then it's going to be a matter of how can you move them into shelters or how can you move them so that they take their meds 
uh, under this new law. And like I said, it still has a due process component. So they still got to go to family court and be adjudicated so that they should have their meds taken. You know, one of the reasons, you know, one of the reasons why many people are saying that there is so much ho uh, homeless on Hawaii streets is because just the overall cost of living is so high. Uh, what would your plans be to sort of help to expand maybe on affordable housing, uh, you know, and, and how do you balance that with just the overall overdevelopment of Hawaii? You know, you look in Kaka'ako, it looks much different than it did, you know, just 10 years ago with a number of new high rises mm -hmm. coming in. Some people are saying it is too much uh, in the urban core, but how do you balance that with the need for housing and also the need for affordable housing, what would be your plan uh, to sort of counter and balance that all together? You know, I think the issue is what is affordable housing? So, you know, uh, for those who are on the streets, right, yeah, we'd be very lucky if we can get them into some kind of affordable rentals with Section 8 type financing. So that because, you know, they obviously need help or they wouldn't be, and these, I'm not talking about anybody who's chronic, I'm talking about people who just need shelter. So in my opinion, there's really no reason why we can't begin to look at these structures around and use them for that purpose. Now that's one set. To give you an example, when I was uh, in the Senate, Kukui Gardens, I don't know if you know Kukui Gardens, but it's right by Alapa, I mean, you know, where it's sort of like Alapai area. And they were going to, and they were on a program where they would, they dedicated it for 30 years into affordable type of rental situation. And they said, okay, we're going to release that now. It's the, the time is up. They can go market. It was the Clarence Ching Foundation who by that time owned it. So we intervened as the state and we bought half of the units. The reason we bought half of the unit is the threat was that if we didn't do something about that, do you know that about 800 people would be homeless Chinatown in the Chinatown area? So we did that. So there's a lot of that kind of opportunities that I believe we got to begin to look at and see what can be done. To buy rentals is to buy and, and, and or to rent. Those are two different sets of, of goals. I think what we need to do is go to rentals, subsidize, to get the people off the streets. That's what we got to focus on versus uh, affordable condos to buy, you know, because it's not necessarily true that that they're going to they're going to go from affordable rentals, open that up and then go to affordable rentals that you're going to I mean, affordable units you're going to buy. Those are different levels of needs. And we have to be very clear. We have to target the group and and make sure that we take care of them first. And I think Children with single parents, for example, should be a prior priority because they're usually the ones who just need the housing situation. I mean, we're talking about sort of different subsets of, of right. our population, right? There are the, the truly homeless, um, and then there are people who are kind of between housing. Maybe mm -hmm. they stay with a relative or they get right. a place for a few months. Um, I mean, the city is facing a shortage by some estimates, 65,000 homes by 2025. Mm -hmm. How will we get there? Do you envision the city doing a, a mass buy of rental units? I mean, what we're, th that 65,000 number is just so vast um, and addressing such different needs. How would you take, how would you chip away at that? Well, you know, it, it's not just the city, right? So technically some would argue that the housing issue, especially that with mental health and all of those other issues are state related. So, you know, the state has the rental housing trust fund and the state has all these different types of subsidies to help people to build, for example, they have DERF, which is the Dwelling Unit Revolving Fund. So they have these different types of programs. I remember there was a decision made by the city at one point where they did not want to actually get into housing, building of housing. Uh, that was after Chinatown Gateway and some of these other projects were done. They didn't want to do that. So, you know, to say that the city has to do 65,000 units, I think is, is wrong. I think it's a, at best, it's a combination of how does the city do, it's like, it's like, is the city responsible for the homeless or is the state responsible for the homeless? We had two homeless czars for a, for a long period of time. Who is responsible? Kakak was a prime example of who's responsible. Kakak is HF, uh, HCDA, it should be state. So what did they do? They transferred it to the city for the city to take care of. And so, you know, it's like, 
wait a minute, what we need to do is have a plan that incorporates everyone because the state has funds. They have the, the and I, the reason I know that is they kind of named it after a, a good friend of mine, Bob Nakata, when they did the rental housing trust fund bill, it was huge, $650 million. And I think the reason that they did that was because they knew that they had the responsibility to, to address this issue as well. So I don't think it's fair to say the city needs to do it. I think what we do have, what is fair is why can't you guys get your act together? And why can't you at least know who's on first, right? I mean, it's like yeah, if, if three people are trying to fix the same problem, you know, why can't you work together versus each one of you trying to, you know, turn the, the wrench or something, you know, you just, just stop and say, okay, who's got the best strength to do it and how do we move forward? That's the problem. And, the, you know, feds have a role in this too. And that's, of course, with the veterans. You know, remember President Obama said there will be no homeless vet on the streets by, I think, the year 2016 was what he was saying. So the feds have a role as well because of the veteran issue. So, you know, it's why isn't there more of a discussion? Or if there is a discussion, why isn't it more productive? And why are we still having the same conversation now? Let's switch to Fast Kind, Ryan. Yeah, that's right. We have about five <laughs> minutes left. And so okay. we're going to do something uh, a little bit different. We're going to do these are called fast kind questions. We're going to ask that you answer them with one word answers or one sentence answers. We're going to get through a variety of ones a little bit more on the lighter side too, to get okay. to know you beyond just, of course, politics. So uh, it's sort of like a lightning round. So quick okay. answers. Here we go. <laughs> what is your go-to potluck dish? <laughs> uh, champuro. Okay. Okay. Nice. It. Um, if you could travel anywhere in the world right now, let's take COVID out of the equi equation. Where would you go? Portugal. Oh, Ooh, good answer. Good choice. That's <laughs> My interesting. <husband> Portuguese. <laughs> there you go. Well, if there were a movie based on your life, what actor would you choose to play you? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know who would play me. Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, well, we're gonna, we're gonna okay, we'll let you think one. about that. How okay, about this okay. one? What, what's your hidden talent? What's something that you're really good at that most people don't know? Cooking. Mm, okay. Oh, I like that. Okay. Well, you know that. You I, you I know that one. That <laughs> one I know. Um, okay, next thinking? question. What candidate running for mayor, of course, other than yourself, do you admire and respect the most? Hmm. I guess I guess I'd have to be consistent and I'd say uh, I'd say Kimberly because she's a woman and she's taking this on okay. and she served in the city council <laughs> and what's your favorite late night dining spot when you've been out you know you've maybe gone to a, a gala or something in town and you want to grab a bite late at night where do you like to go Dippies. Good choice. Popular answer there. It's probably the only one open. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, question here: the Beaky program. Do you think it's a good idea, a good program, or do you think it takes up too many parking stalls? You know, it's a good program. I have to say that because Michael Formby was my chief of staff. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I do think it takes up a lot of space. Um, and let's let's go to the heart here. What's the kindest thing that someone has ever done for you? I would have to say it's my grandparents for raising me the way they did. Great answers. Well, That's thank you nice. so much for that. Uh, we want to also provide you an opportunity, just final thoughts here as we kind of wrap things up. Uh, what is your message, of course, to those out there who may be watching, those voters, obviously in this time of COVID where social interaction is limited, uh, here's a chance for you to kind of talk to, directly to the voters. What would you say to them? I'd say, you know, thank you for the great opportunity that you've given me, a political journey that uh, it's, compares to nothing that I, I can see. And uh, it's been an honor to serve the people of the state of Hawaii and especially city and county of Honolulu. And I do want you all to stay safe and to know that this mayor's election is a very important election. And the reason why I'm running is because I believe that I can best represent you and I can hit the ground running, and I have the experience that you need. 
Thank All you. right, great. Great to thank speak you so much you. For, for being here. Yes, thank you so much, Colleen Hanabusa, for joining us this thank morning you. on Spotlight Hawaii. We do appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Aloha. Aloha. Well, great to talk to her. Wonderful to cover those issues. One of the comments I saw in there uh, from Walter Miski was, hope the advertiser gives equal time to all the other candidates on that topic. Uh, the next person that we will be talking to on Wednesday is Mufi Hanneman. Here's a schedule. Uh, we worked with the editorial board over at the paper, and this is the list that we settled on. Uh, so there are, of course, 15 people running for this seat. We are going to sit down and talk to six of them one-on-one -on -one in this format. Uh, you heard from Colleen Hanabusa today. Mufi Hanneman joins us on Wednesday. The next week, it's Rick Blangiardi and Chun James. And then finally, Keith Amamiya and Kim Pine the week after that. Um, we really appreciate all of you for being here with us and we appreciate the Office of Elections. We want to remind you that this year, Hawaii votes by mail. Your mailbox is your ballot box. That's right. And so we want to encourage all of you, if you have not yet registered or if you have questions about your address, if you've moved uh, or just want to make sure and confirm that you are in fact registered and will receive a ballot, make sure you head over to elections.hawaii.gov. There's also a number 453 vote that you can call and check up on and encourage you to do that uh, as soon as possible. Do it this week uh, as the deadline is approaching. It's actually this week, Wednesday, I believe. Is That's the right, deadline. Wednesday is the deadline. So do it now while you have it top of mind. It's so important. Um, you know, as, as Colleen Hanabusa was saying, this election is so important. Elections are always important, but in the age of COVID, we really see that the, the power that our local officials have in deciding where funding goes, because it is limited, or what things are open. You know, those are decisions that the mayor is making day to day. What bars, you know, bars open, gyms close, what, you know, what have you. So um, it really is important that you believe in the leadership uh, and that starts at a very local level. And that's right. Of course, we will try to get to as many questions as we can. We always encourage you to be involved as well. If you have questions for us, uh, make sure to enter that into the comments. And again, we will be back here on Wednesday at 1030 with uh, another mayoral candidate in Mufi Hanneman. But until then, we will see you and encourage you to stay safe and uh, be kind to everyone out there. Aloha. Aloha.